Twenty years after her kidnap, Elizabeth has now grown above the circumstances surrounding her as she is celebrating her 20th anniversary since the kidnap. She is now an advocate for victims and survivors of kidnap and abduction, and she talks about her ordeal a lot. But back in 2002, she wasn't even sure she would come out of her situation alive. Today's story goes beyond the abduction story of 14 years old Elizabeth Smart and goes into everything surrounding the before, during and after of this tragic experience. Get your popcorn and blanket, you're in for one hell of a story. I feel that when we're rescued, that yay, happy ending, it's all over. Literally the newspaper said that, yeah. happy ending. Yeah. It's not an ending, this isn't, the book doesn't close and I just vanish. On account of the sisterhood speech, the emotions of being rescued do not end the day you are found. It extends even into the years to come and your perspective of life afterwards. Sometimes regrets and negativity may set in, but never you give up. It happened one dreadful morning on the 4th of June 2002. Young Elizabeth woke up to the threat of a strange voice. I have a knife at your neck. Don't make a sound. Get up and come with me. I had felt the knife line across my neck. I could feel its edge. I didn't know if this man had gone through my house already. Surely if he had gotten all the way upstairs to my bedroom, he must have killed someone. Or, But I did know that my younger sister was in bed next to me and that she was still alive. And I didn't want to even begin to imagine what would happen to her if I didn't go with this man. So I immediately got up and I did exactly everything that he said. I remember getting farther and farther away from my home. We kept going what felt like forever. We'd gone so far, we'd crossed right over the top of the mountain and we were starting down the other side. Her days with the abductors were full of agony and anguish. After the days she was abducted, she lived her life in fear of being killed, and on numerous occasions she was sexually assaulted and threatened by her abductor, Michelle and Barzi. Days went by with so many leaflets of Elizabeth circulating Salt Lake City, but still there was no sign of Elizabeth. But guess what? After months of fruitless search and investigation, the only person who might know exactly what transpired was able to give an undeniable account of how Elizabeth was taken away. Quiet. If you scream, I'll shoot you, but if you don't, I won't harm you. Does his voice sound familiar to you? Yeah. Can you tell me where you've heard that before? No, I can't remember. Hey, you said you met him on the street. Do you know what street that was? In the downtown, inside in that area, you know where a lot of homeless people go and... Uh -huh. And when was the next time that you saw this man? Oh, we, we came up to our house. We came in the front door, and I know he saw me or Elizabeth going to our room with Emmanuel, the man who was in your bedroom. I'm not quite sure it might have been. I'm not quite sure, but it might have been. And this made way for a direct investigation. Mary Catherine, Elizabeth's sister, provided the authorities with helpful information about the morning Elizabeth was kidnapped. This was the beginning of a new search, and even with all the hints, the rescue did not take place until five months later. On the 12th of March 2003, a 911 call was made. Yeah, um, could you tell me, is this like how, um, if I think I see that Emmanuel that I'm looking for? This call came from the sandy neighborhood from someone who noticed three people disguised in white robes, and upon getting surrounded by the police, these abductors gave made-up stories. The two adults were fluent while the other young teenager had a disguise on was speaking in fear. One of the cops suspected the young girl might be Elizabeth. When I got out of my car, I asked them what their names were. They gave me Peter Marshall, Juliet Marshall, and Augustine Marshall. But this girl standing off to the side really stood out to me because she had this disguise on. It just didn't fit. She was wearing a wig, a gray-haired wig, claiming that she was 17 or 18. She was the only one out of three wearing some sort of disguise. So they separated her from the adults for interrogation. She was able to speak and communicate properly without fear. The only thing she wanted was to be reunited with her family. I always wanted to be rescued. I don't know that I always had hope. There were some pretty dark times for sure, she said. After nine months, the Smarts reunited with their daughter. Detective said, Ed, 
um, I want you to stop everything right now and come directly down to the Sandy Police Department. I got down to the Sandy Police and an officer said, oh, Mr. Smart, come this way. And I went down this hallway and turned to the right and I stood there and I looked at this girl and I said, Elizabeth, is it you? She said, yes, Dad. And I, I stood there crying and crying and crying. We're here to announce officially that we have found uh, Elizabeth Smart. As he sat there holding me, it was the happiest moment of my life. And I just knew that whatever lay in front of me, whatever whatever might happen, it was going to be okay because no matter what, my dad was going to be there. I knew it was going to be okay. And the joy could not be contained even by the residents of Lake City. It was a major win for everybody. In 2011, Elizabeth Smart founded a foundation in her name and she became a very powerful advocate for sexual assault victims and survivors. It took Elizabeth 10 years to publicly talk about her experience with her captors. Elizabeth recounts her ordeal and it is nothing you could ever imagine. I will never ever forget how I felt, how broken I felt that even if someone did find me, what was the point? I was useless. <laughs> I was disgusting. I fell asleep thinking those thoughts, and when I woke up, there was this man kneeling over me again. And this time, he had taken a thick metal cable and had wrapped it around my ankle and had bolted it into place so that I couldn't run away. I remember looking at this cable and just wondering, how long would I live for? Would it be a year? Would it be a few weeks? Would it be many years? What if it was so long that I forgot who I was? And that thought really, really scared me. After Michelle kidnaps her and crosses to the other side of the mountain, his wife, Barzi, gave her a frightening hug and forced her into a tent before Michelle came to perform a wedding vow and raped her. She is always threatened and scolded anytime she shouts or speaks in disagreement. The younger teenager becomes more frightened, fragile, and full of fear. Her only hope was her undying love for her mother. So I started to think of everyone and everything that was important to me. And at the very top of that list, my mom. She was the one person who, more than anything, I didn't want to forget. I didn't want to forget anything about her. The way she looked, the way she sounded, the way she smelled, the way that I, I felt when she told me. Just so safe. And as I sat there trying to just absolutely engrave each of these memories on my brain, I had one very specific memory come to mind. My mom just said, Elizabeth, you know, I love you. And I always will. Nothing can ever change that. No matter where you go or what you do, you'll always be my daughter and I'll always want what's best for you. And as I sat on this mountainside, I realized that she was right. I realized that it didn't matter. All of these things that had happened to me, as terrible as they were, it wouldn't make a difference to her. We would still be a family. And even if I died and never saw them again, they would still be my family and they would still of me. 2003, nine months after her disappearance, that sunny afternoon, while they were walking, all of a sudden, a police convoy surrounded them with a roller coaster of emotions. She began to panic, hoping that her predicament would end. She recounted that there may be run ins with the police, but her captors always have a backup story by portraying themselves as ministers of Christ. She soon understood that was their gateway response. The couple would camouflage under religious beliefs to carry out their horrendous actions so that Mitchell could rape little girls and get away with it. But her case was different. Her parents were very resilient and the authorities kept doing their best with the support of the community. Everybody just wanted Elizabeth to come back home. It's real! <laughs> it's real! Elizabeth is, is happy. She's well. And we are so happy to have her back in our arms. At a time, a police officer came up to her kidnappers. 
Brian David Mitchell and Wanda Barzi, both husband and wife, at a library a few months before her abduction. He questioned them about the teenager. She recalled how, only a few months after her kidnapping, a police officer approached her captors, Brian David Mitchell and Wanda Barzi, at a library and questioned them about the youngster, who was wearing a veil to conceal her identity. That teen happened to be herself. Mitchell's response to the officer was that he and his wife were ministers of Christ and that the veil was used to shield their daughter for her future marriage. Can you imagine the level of idiocracy and how they found the perfect and undisputable lie you would ever hear? Over the years, they capitalized on religious faith and that was how they got away from every police. While Mitchell was doing the lie speech, Barzi grabbed onto Elizabeth's leg in a warning to keep quiet. After the rescue at Sandy in Utah, 18 miles away from her home, Mitchell was sentenced to life in prison for aggravated kidnapping, aggravated sexual assault, and aggravated burglary for the kidnapping of Smart and the attempted kidnapping of her cousin. But Barzi was sentenced to 15 years, which she finished serving in 2018. The now 35-year-old mother of three with a loving husband expressed her gratitude through her Instagram page without holding back words while marking her 20 years rescue anniversary. Her post reads, Yesterday was my 20th rescue anniversary. I was able to celebrate by relaxing at home and spending time with my little family. Thank you so much for all the kind messages I received, the many prayers I've been the recipient of for many years, and all the love I've been shown. I'll never be able to express my full gratitude enough. It is fair to say I could have never imagined my life turning out the way it has. 20 years ago, when I was kidnapped, I didn't know if I would survive. Each day was a question right up until I was rescued. Once I was rescued, it was a roller coaster of emotion, and honestly felt like we were all still stepping into the unknown. And now, 20 years later, looking back, although it was difficult and often overwhelming, I'm so grateful for my experiences and the path it has led me down. Meeting my husband, having children, learning a whole new level of empathy and compassion, meeting the most amazing and dedicated individuals, and being able to devote my life to a cause that I feel so passionate about and feeling like I'm contributing to the betterment of humanity is more than I could ask for. Thank you again, and God bless you all. Elizabeth is now a proactive advocate for victims and survivors of assaults. In 2019, she was able to bring together six women who were survivors of America's most famous abduction to create a sisterhood bond. One of the main purposes of the bond was to help a recently rescued victim, Jane Kloss, to discuss the terrors and aftermath of being a survivor and how she could possibly manage life. Nothing will prepare you for the horrific conditions these women had to survive through. Jame was a younger teenager of age 13 who was kidnapped from her Wisconsin home in October 2019 in the middle of the night. It was during the kidnap that her parents were murdered. 13-year-old Jame was left to suffer in a secluded basement of a cabin about 80 miles away from her house. Jamie was here isolated in the basement of her 21-year-old captor's family cabin, trapped in the homemade dungeon he'd prepared specifically for her. After three months, brave Jame was able to make an escape for herself and her abductor went out, leaving Jame without food or water. In January, Jame managed to run out of the house after Jake went on a long drive. She found a residence and she cried for help, and that was how Jame escaped from her days of terror. Jame helped the police to solve her case by describing what he looks like and what type of car he drove. Mr. Jake Patterson was soon arrested and brought to justice. Patterson was charged with two counts of murder and one count of kidnapping. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. The court is imposing regarding the first degree intentional homicide of James Kloss. I sentence you to life imprisonment without the eligibility for release on extended supervision. On the day of his sentencing, Jame was not present at the court, but six of her family members were there to represent her. Those statements conveyed real emotions. You could practically hear the pain in each word. James' uncle, Mike Kloss, spoke about how Patterson took the life of his brother James and his sister-in-law, Denise, James' mother, and how he held his niece hostage for 88 days. He described how the family lived in fear, wondering if they too would be targeted, he said. Because of this monster, Jane won't have her mum and dad at her dance recitals, won't have her mum and dad at prom, homecoming dance. My brother won't be able to walk her down the aisle on her wedding day. Although Jane was not in court, attorney Chris Gramstrup read a statement on her behalf. I will always have my freedom and he will not. Jake Patterson can never take away my courage. He thought he could control me, but he couldn't. Jane's statement read, I felt like what he did is what a coward would do. He can never take away my spirit. He can't stop me from being happy and moving forward with my life. 
I will go on to do great things, and he will not. According to Barron County District Attorney Brian Wright, Jane does not have to worry about getting hurt anymore because Patterson would forever be behind bars. Before the final verdict, Patterson also read an apology message to his victim, but that would not turn back the hands of time. I would do absolutely anything to take back what I did. I would die, absolutely anything to bring them back. I don't care about me, I'm just so sorry. And why is Elizabeth taking interest in her case despite the fact that she has been rescued? Unlike some victims, Jame has lost both of her parents during this incident, and that could cause bigger problems in helping her move on. But these six survivors, Gina DeJesus, Katie Beers, Alicia Kozikweksis, Sarah Maynard, Kara Robinson and Denise Huskins have come together to speak about their personal challenges to help Jame move forward and not dwell on her past. These women discussed forgiveness and they also reflected on themselves. They self-blamed and also rendered advice to Jame. Let's talk briefly about the stories of these survivors. Gina DeJesus was captured at the age of 14 in 2004 by Ariel Castro alongside Amanda Berry and Michelle Knight. They were held captive for nine years in a Cleveland home with no hopes of being remembered. Gina was held captive in a horrible condition, but she was later rescued in 2013 after Amanda Berry had managed to escape and contact the police for help. This is but a heroic action. Berry cannot be condemned enough. Nine years away from the family at such a young age is never the easiest of all. Up next is 10-year-old Katie Beers, who was abducted by a family friend in 1992 and was kept in a coffin-sized underground bunker for 17 days without sunlight or fresh air. You definitely cannot be too careful around people, but you have to be observant. Once there are unexplainable actions, or new behavior, or abnormalities, that is definitely a sign and one thing you should trust is your instincts. Sarah Maynard was just a young 13 years old teenager who was captured and held for four days, bound and assaulted in a basement dungeon after her mother and brother were murdered with their bodies found stuffed in a tree. The sadness that comes with the realization that you would not be with your loved ones again can be shattering. Mere thinking of this could cause a permanent scar in mind not to talk about experiencing them. No matter how horrific it sounded, these ladies did not refrain from sharing their stories. 13 years old Alicia Kozavekic was kidnapped by a 38-year-old online predator. He was raped and tortured repeatedly for four days in a basement dungeon. And the most gruesome was him live-streaming the abuse online. That is to tell you how vicious they could get. The list still goes on. These ladies have indeed come a long way. 15 years old Kara Robinson was abducted by a serial killer, who bound her to his bed and sexually assaulted her. But in the middle of the night, while he slept, she planned her own escape. It takes a bold step for you to work out your own escape. The most terrific part is the fear of getting caught while attempting to escape. Denise Huskins, one of the most recent survivors, was kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and held for ransom for two days. Police initially called her case a hoax. The abductors of these women were legally charged and sentenced, but these women have to live beyond their ordeals. They are currently in their 30s and above and have come this far, but they still choose to lend their voices to many others who cannot be heard. In Smart's word of encouragement, she said, I think that's so important for Jane to know, for her to hear. This is a sisterhood that's unlike any other. Let's take time and talk about helping her move forward. I feel that when we are rescued, that yay happy ending it's all over, literally the newspapers said that happy ending, recalls Kozakiewicz. It's not an ending, she continues, this book doesn't close and I just vanish. Huskins then reveals she found it hard not to blame herself and wonder what she could have done differently. It's hard not to reflect back at what you could have done differently and not blame yourself. Yeah. A lot of people have asked me, like, why didn't you do this? Like, if they knew what they would actually do, they would kidnap. This poster just reminds me that this girl, she doesn't exist anymore actually, Smart says looking at a picture of her 14-year-old self. Beers tells the group that she sees a traumatized little girl before adding, I'm not that same child, I'm stronger. Smart had taken A to Wisconsin to see the secluded cabin where Patterson held Jame captive for nearly three months. Jamie was here, isolated in the basement of her 21-year-old captor's family cabin, trapped in the homemade dungeon he'd prepared specifically for her. He even threw a party here for his family at Christmas time. He would often do this if people stopped by his home, adds journalist Beth McDonough, who accompanied Smart on the visit. He would take her downstairs, lock her up, turn up the radio so the people who were at his home also couldn't hear her if she tried to make some sort of a sound. It was a strategy DeJesus knew all too well from her many years spent being locked in Castro's home. Smart also traveled to Wisconsin to see the secluded cabin pictured. His band would come over and practice and 
If it wasn't his band, then it was his family that came over sometimes. He would come upstairs and he would tell us to be quiet, don't move. And he would turn up the radio so the other visitors wouldn't hear us. Anne Patterson's homemade dungeon was similar to the underground bunker where Beers was held by her abductor. My captor had intentions of keeping me indefinitely. In this um, coffin-sized box, there was a chain where my head would be. There were actually handcuffs on either side of this bed. He actually chained me to the wall, so I wasn't able to move. I'm the luckiest girl in the world, Elizabeth Smart exclaimed, since she was rescued after nine months in captivity with the sweet Instagram post as she prepares to speak about moving forward in the hometown of kidnap victim Jane Kloss. As she looked upon Patterson's house, Smart couldn't help but recall her horrific abduction memories. People came in and out of the house and never knew she was there. It's terrifying, Smart said as she gazed upon the secluded cabin. It makes me think of the times I was brought out in public, but because I was veiled and covered, nobody knew anything, nobody said anything. It was a real act of courage to escape from this house. Smarts have found a new purpose and happiness in helping others. She is a child safety activist, author and commentator and is out with a new cause for teaching consent. On CBS Morning on the 10th of March, Smart gave an in-depth details of this new course. Wholehearted consent is intended to teach kids about setting boundaries and avoiding unwanted approaches. I want them to know what consent is and isn't, Smart added. I have met so many survivors and regrettably most victims of rape know the culprit, and it's often with their romantic relationship. It is with the individual that they choose to invest their time and confidence. The program is divided into six modules and 38 short movies that urge viewers to consider what they are comfortable with without being taught what is proper or wrong. According to Smart, the program is intended to inspire self-reflection and assist individuals in identifying their own boundaries. If you don't know where your boundaries are and something happens, it might be disastrous. It may follow you around and shadow you for years, she stated. Smart relied on her mother's counsel to get where she is now. Growing up, so the day after I was rescued, she said to me, Elizabeth, what this man has done to you is terrible. There aren't words strong to describe how wicked and evil he is. He's stolen nine months of your life that you will never get back. Yeah. But the best punishment you could ever give him is to be happy. 